You are listening to the R Podcast, episode 30. Welcome back to the R Podcast. We are on episode 30, as you heard, and my name is Eric Nance, and thank you so much for joining me today. And in this episode, I have a very um, awesome interview that I've conducted with um, the R Studio uh, president, uh, Tarif Kowaf, that you'll hear very shortly. But first, I want to um, announce, or at least remind others, about a new venture that I've launched in the past couple weeks called the Shiny Developer Series. And we've had, um, I've released kind of an episode zero and an episode one that was actually a recording of the uh, latest R Studio community webinar where I had the pleasure of talking about Shiny's past and future with Winston Chang and from R Studio as one of their software engineers uh, behind Shiny itself. And so I'm just to iterate with this audience, I mean, I'm going to kind of keep these ventures, you might say, somewhat separate, but um, I will be obviously working on both. So the RPOC is still alive and well, and it's already not going away. But I think there's been so much interesting uh, developments with Shiny, especially with the future of Shiny, that I thought it, it deserved its own separate kind of um, uh, venture or, or separate mechanism for how I want to relay those ideas. So um, feel free to send me feedback about that series and of course for the podcast going forward. But let's not uh, wait any longer. I want to now bring to you my interview with our studio's president, Tarif Kowaf. Welcome back, everybody. Um, if you've been listening to the R podcast for, you know, whether it's the beginning or even midstream, you've seen that I've had the distinct pleasure of talking to some very talented people in the community, especially some very talented software engineers from our studio themselves. But one thing we never really touched on yet is not just the technical developments within our studio, but more about the business side of it, and especially running a company like our studio that has such talented engineers that are making these open source packages and what things they do to sustain their business and their plans going forward. So I am very excited to have on the podcast, uh, our studio's president, Tarif Kowaf. Uh, Tarif, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So um, for those listeners that are not familiar with yourself, um, maybe you could give us uh, a little bit about your background and tell us a bit about how you joined our studio and your motivation for uh, for joining our studio. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a funny story. I was um, so my background is in computer science and mathematics. I was uh, uh, running an engineering team. I was running engineering and operations for an online video platform called uh, uh, Brightcove, and I left the company in December of 2012. And I thought to myself, you know what? I haven't had any breaks. So I was my goal is to take three months off and uh, uh, and teach my you know sort of retool myself, right? I was a software engineer by training, and I, th- I thought, you know what? I had been hearing about this uh, language called R and uh, MOOCs, and so I looked up Coursera, and there was a course out there called um, Data Analysis with R, and it was uh, Roger Pang and the, the Johns Hopkins uh, team there. And at the time, it was like a six-week course. It's now sort of blown up into like a nine-part, like nine-month uh, uh, certifi- certified uh, uh, track for, for that. But at the time, it was a six-week course. And Roger Pang, you know, first day, he was like, all right, you know, here's how you set up R, and you can use the... Uh, uh, you should download the RStudio IDE, but, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to use uh, Emacs. You know, so I used Emacs ESS mode because I'm like, whatever, why, why would I want to download one more thing here? So, um, and every week he would say the same thing. And the fifth week of the course, I ended up installing the uh, RStudio IDE, uh, completed the assignment with that. And then the sixth week uh, was the last week of the course. And interestingly, I had breakfast with JJ um, the week after that. 
you know, we sort of got introduced through uh, through his brother. And um, you know, my my assumption had been that we were just meeting to sort of talk about potential candidates for him for a VP of engineering position. Um, and um, um, and so we ended up uh, talking about company construction and and you know philosophies and whatnot and. Um, and basically, I walked out of that breakfast thinking, I think he may have just offered me the role to run the company. And <laughs> and uh, so I had to call my wife up. And uh, that's sort of how the story of, of how I came to uh, to join our studio in the first place. Well, that's that's quite interesting. So you, you came in with, like you said, some software engineering background. Um, just with respect to R itself, did learning R from your perspective seem, uh, you might hear from other people, that come from computer science say that learning R is a bit of a strange task. That has Absolutely, a yeah. Synchronicity. So you sounds Absolutely. like you experienced those things Absolutely, too. yeah. So, so I I can relate to that in a at a way in a way that's that's actually uh, very different than other people. So when I even when I now when I go and talk to customers or prospects, you know, I'll tell them, listen, I come from a computer science background, and when I looked at R, I was like, what the heck? You know, what what are what are people thinking? Why is this language <laughs> work the way it does? And it's uh, it's odd, but that you know that was also you have to remember this is pre tidyverse too, right? Um, yes. And so for me, what I what I found really powerful is once you understand, you know, when in, in high school in college they sort of taught us this language called Scheme, right? Which is a dialect of Lisp. And uh, when people look at Scheme or Lisp the first time, they're like, "What the heck is going on?" It's the same kind of reaction. And if you once, but once your brain clicks, um, everything sort of falls into place. And for me, it's the same thing with R. Um, once you understand, like, hey, the the key ethos and the idea of vectorization and, and functional programming and whatnot, uh, you can um, you can do some really really incredible things um, in terms of uh, what what the language was created for, right? And so that's it's the same kind of reaction for me. Is is, and so I, I tell software engineers, I'm like, listen. I know you're going to judge it, but if you remember studying Scheme or if you remember running, you know, learning some of these other languages, uh, they open up your mind different ways, and they're really well suited for certain tasks in a way that like other languages are not. You know, um, so um, so anyway, I'm a fan. Oh, good. We're we're in good company then. I've been a, a fan for a long time. That's why I do this podcast because it's a you know I've joked in my very first episode to save my dissertation because things like SAS didn't have the right mechanisms to do. The analyses I needed to complete it. And then once I saw somebody wrote a package that did the exact statistical method I needed, and I could just build simulations off that, I was like, okay, I want to learn this more often. So yeah, it's a remarkable, I, it's a remarkable ecosystem. But honestly, what's even more remarkable to me is, is the community behind it. Like, there's, I, I have, you know, I've been around the block in software field for a very long time. And I, you know, I don't remember uh, uh, meeting sort of this a group of not just really really smart people, but very smart, very humble, very nice, very welcoming. You know that combination is just super super rare, and uh, it's something that I, I you know all of us at our studio really really treasure, and it matters a lot to us. And so um, so there's it's you know it's honestly it's a privilege to work for such a community. Absolutely, and we'll be hitting on the community in some of my later questions, but um, let's. Let's now say that, yeah, you've joined our studio with, with JJ. Yep. Tell us a bit about how the company started forming their structure, because as of now, I've had you know pleasure of talking with quite a few of you at, at our studio, and you divide yourself into various groups that handle different purposes. But give us kind of a high level for those that aren't familiar with the overall structure of the company. Yeah. So, I mean, the the when, when JJ and I were talking, one of the key questions... So it's you know it's exciting, very flattering to to, to be told, hey, you know what, you can uh, come and help build this company and run it, and you know all the crazy ideas that we have about team construction and and uh, culture and whatnot are are now sort of my problems to 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 make you know to affect in reality, right? And um, but uh, but one of the key questions you have to ask yourself is like, hey, how do you make money when you're giving away everything for free, right? And so what we decided to do is sort of raise a round of funding. Um, and, uh, and we told our investors that like, our goal here is to build a profitable business, right? And, uh, and for that, we're going to run what is called the, the, uh, open core play. And, and we, we believe in this idea of like smaller teams that, you know, highly, very, very talented people, you give them room to operate and, and the freedom to sort of recreate amazing things, uh, with hopefully a culture that, that allows for, uh, feedback so that, you know, you, you know, nobody, nobody's, uh, Everybody's opinions uh, can be heard. Everybody has a, has a voice to sort of, uh, and, and you can sort of debate things based on the merits of the data as opposed to sort of positional power, if you will. 
So yeah, so we raised the we raised a round of funding. We we hired uh, a bunch of uh, early engineers. We took our open source server product and added uh, capabilities that we thought uh, we could go that would help us sort of sell to enterprises, right? And uh, and so those are the features around like security, authentication, monitoring, tuning, scaling, uh, collaboration. You know, uh, getting a commercial license of the software as well as getting premium support for the software. And so and we thought, you know what? Uh, what would be really interesting is to make this uh, uh, make make our pricing public. Let's make it super easy for people to buy from us, and um, and uh, you know, and, and see what happens. And so, does that uh, does that answer the question? Is yeah, that, that's already yeah. a, a good chunk of it. And I just wanted to get a high level as well of what different kind of teams you have. Yeah, so we have a bunch video. of teams. Yeah, so so over time, like in the beginning, in the beginning, we obviously had very few teams, right? Because you basically had Hadley uh, working on um, what is now the the tidyverse, right? And you had uh, Joe and Winston were working on Shiny, and then you had JJ and Jonathan working on the IDE, right? And that's like very, very, very early days. And then we hired Jeff and we worked on Shiny Server Pro. But um, so today, if you take a look at uh, uh, the teams, we have, you know, we typically don't like to see teams, like people working together on a given problem. We usually are like two to three people working on a problem together. Um, and they they are loosely in you know sort of loosely federated if you will with with a with a larger team, but um, so you know the, the if you take a look at Hadley's team the tidyverse there's like six or seven engineers, um, and and you know usually it's like one to one to two person teams essentially working on on things right and um, but they meet together on a regular basis and they talk about it but so that's like that might be the Hadley side of the world right and the the the, the shiny team. Um, you know, has five engineers and, and they're working on, sometimes they're working on things together. So other times they're just taking, you know, taking a, a feature all the way through um, with a single engineer. Uh, same thing with the IDE, same thing with uh, Connect um, uh, and uh, RStudio Package Manager, RStudio Server, the IDE, RStudio Server Pro. So it's, you know, we keep adding, as we add uh, RStudio Cloud, right, and the Shiny Apps IO, the hosted team essentially sort of manages both of those. So, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a big believer in smaller teams. And, and, and so whenever, whenever we need, we have to do more work, the key problem to solve is how do you decompose, um, how do you can decompose the work so that you can have, uh, um, you know, smaller teams working on the, on the subsets, right? And then the challenge becomes how do you sort of coordinate across when, when there are cross dependencies, but the goal is to try and keep the cross dependencies to a minimum. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that, that's very helpful, actually. And um, I can I can vouch for your ideas of smaller teams in my experience, even in, in the company I'm at currently, it can really help you focus better and, you know, network together and, you know, attack a problem, you know, concurrently. It's it's very helpful not to have, you know, very bloated out teams, especially for the, the kind of work that you all do. I'm um, so in, in, in awe sometimes of, how talented all of your engineers are for, you know, developing Shiny, which I'm quite biased of, as you probably know. Yep, and uh, yep. I see the Tidyverse side of it and, and things like that. Um, so getting back to, you mentioned how our studio is using this kind of open core model with, you know, releasing open source versions of things like the R Studio ID and, of course, the R packages that the software engineers are making. Um, in the open source community, I know you, your company, our studio is definitely not the first one to do this kind of model. I'm just curious if you've learned from experiences either through the previous startups that you were involved with or just looking at the open source community as a whole. Have you had any lessons that you've been able to take from watching that and how you've been able to build a business around our studio? Yeah. So, I mean, interestingly enough, like in that first breakfast uh, that JJ and I had together, we, we were talking about, you know, how would you make money in, in, a, in a business where you're giving away most of the software for free? And I, you know, my intuition, um, you know, has been and continues to be supported that like, it's very difficult for people to justify paying for something that they can get for free, right? And um, it, it's just like, it's human nature, right? And, and it turns out like it's an old problem, right? There's the, the, the notion of the tragedy of the commons, if you will, from, from the middle ages. Right. So the, uh, so what I believe is we, you need to give people an excuse to be able to buy the stuff. Right. And you have to, you have to have a, you have to have a reason, uh, for them to buy even so they can explain it to, to, you know, their CFO, for example, like I've, I've literally had conversations with, with folks who will tell me things like, Oh, we have, 
you know, we have f- 300 or 500 people that are using uh, our studio every day. They, they literally, that's the number one thing that gets booted up when they come in in the morning and they spend eight hours a day in it. And I'm like, well, would you guys consider buying some of our commercial products to support us? And, and, they, and they literally, in, this, in the next breath, will say, oh, I don't know if I can justify it to my, I can't, I don't know if I can justify it to my management. And I'm like, well, you just said, I mean, you just said that you're spending eight hours a day, that it matters a lot to you. You love the company, but, but anyway, so, so getting the commercial product. So we decided like it's, it's, it would be valuable for us to uh, have something that they get for the money. And it's not just uh, support or consulting, right? That's, that was sort of a, an important decision for us because what we thought would be really valuable is to be able to have folks like Hadley and JJ and Joe and, you know, and Max and Jim, I mean, there's a long list and Jenny, like are are able to focus on building software and not having to answer, you know, not have to be going, you know, selling their time for consulting, if you will. Right. Um, Sure. So, so that, that was sort of our thesis to be honest, the open source uh, monetization narrative is it's not, it's not a, it's not a done deal, right? If, if anything, I think we still have a lot of open questions here. You probably have been watching and seeing what's been going on with like uh, Redis and MongoDB as, as a Absolutely. cloud. And, yes. um, you know, uh, Cloudera, which was the other company that was running an open core play, just announced that they're going all open source. Uh, I don't know how successful they're going to be. I mean, when I look at the world, I say, you know, there's really one company that's open source that I'm aware of that was wildly profitable, which was uh, Red Hat. Absolutely. And they just got bought by IBM. And they just got bought by IBM. But, you know, I mean, Red Hat is an amazing story, but you're still talking about 3.4 billion or 4 billion at the the peak. You know, I mean, as far as software companies that that drive a lot of value, that's not a, that's not, you know, it's nothing compared to what other big software companies drive in terms of revenue. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like if you take that to Oracle or SAP or, or Microsoft or, um, you know, or IBM's uh, software businesses. I mean, this is this is a, a drop in the bucket, right? To be one of the product lines, right? That that sure. would be bigger than that. So, yeah. Uh, so all I'm saying to you is like, I it's not clear to me how big an open source company can get because of the the natural limiting. Uh, you know, they're, they're, I, I tell our customers, I'm like, listen, the good news for you is that we can't gouge you. We can't gouge you in pricing because you always can go to our open source, right? So hopefully we're, we're adding enough value to justify paying for the software and supporting us because we do invest, um, you know, to, as, of, as of end of March, I think we're investing like over 50% of all of our engineering in free and open source software and more than 50% of the company is engineering, right? So that's a, you know, you're talking about in a company of 120 people, you're talking about over 30 engineers that are sort of building things that, are, that we can give away, which is, uh, which is awesome, right? And so, but, um, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think we've seen, um, this this narrative is not done right. I think there's a there's a lot of pressure, um, and it's questionable whether whether you can have an open source business that uh, that is uh, profitable long term, or does it end up being that all open source projects have to be owned by some of the biggest uh, uh, corporations in the world, right? Like the Facebooks and Microsofts and Googles and IBMs of the world, right? Yeah, absolutely, and, and you know, I'll, I'll share maybe my my hope for the future that whatever happens in terms of the future of your company, that you still keep the same vision of you. You mentioned being very involved in the community, but also you know having such talented engineers be able to work on these packages and yep. and like you, yeah, that's a part that the community has you know very much embraced. And I think you've probably seen this, but I'll just reiterate that. There is a lot of value with the opinions, but also the direction that our studio takes with the global art community. And we're always very uh, watching, you know, the, the trends that your company is showing in terms of the developments and and the voice that, that you represent. So we definitely hope that that keeps going. Oh, yeah. No, it's a very valuable part. Absolutely. Of it. Absolutely. And, and we are very like we're, we're trying we've set ourselves up uh, organizationally and uh, you know, and structurally so that our, our belief is that the right thing to do is to make sure that this company is around 20, 30 years from now, right? And is able to continue to, 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 to create a lot of value in the open source side. So that is, that is the mission that we are on. That's, you know, like to me, that is the, that's the success scenario. And that's what, that's, that's all I think about, you know, uh, in terms of how we think about building this business. So. Yeah, very good points. And um, one the trend I've noticed as well, and this is, probably been over the last few years is that, of course, the major focus of our studio is building around R itself and the ID and things like that. But there have been a lot of recent efforts to build integrations with other frameworks or languages, 
of course, I'm thinking particularly about Python lately mm-hmm. and, and with that yep. TensorFlow. Um, I'm just curious how the, the motivation for building those integrations, yep. was it based on customer feedback? Was it based on the overall vision that you and JJ had? Well, tell us kind of the backstory. Around yeah. So, so, I mean, I think, you know, I, I tell customers this all the time. Like when you, when you think about the, the history of R, you know, R is the open source implementation, right, of language S from the 70s, right, in the yes. Bell Labs. And, and, and when you look at what, why they created the language S, they basically, to my knowledge, created it because they wanted, it, they wanted to create a tool that made it easier for, uh, for those statisticians to be able to interact and to have an interactive uh, uh, um, way of working with uh, the Fortran libraries and the C libraries that they had at the time, right? And so they created an interface language and, and, and leveraged those underlying um, uh, libraries, right? And if you take a look at R and you take a look at, like sort of saying, let's, let's take an example of Shiny, right? So Shiny is framework in R, but it's really leveraging a lot of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? Yes. Um, and if you take a look at, um, you know, anything that is using RCPP, right? That's, it's just that R is, a, is an interface language to a whole bunch of underlying systems. And so, you know, a few years ago, we ended up uh, investing in a package called Sparkly R. And the reason we did is because we were like, all right, the R community deserves to have a really good connection into the Spark ecosystem and the power that's inside that, right? And, and today you can write really interesting code in R. Uh, it's tidy, you know, literally it looks like deep layer code, but at the end of the day, it might be leveraging, you know, a, a 100 node cluster underneath the hood, right? So for, for the, the, the Python work that we did sort of came along because of the TensorFlow and Keras work that's out there, because, you know, because we're like, hey, listen, this is a whole ecosystem that's really, really powerful, and we're not going to be, you know, we're not going to be foolish about this and say, oh, we're not, we don't touch anything related to X. We're like, if this is, if this is the work, if our data scientists in the R community need to be able to leverage it, then, um, and and we're in a position to make that investment, let's go ahead and uh, and make that happen, right? So. Um, and as a as a side effect of doing all that work, you know, we ended up with a reticulate package, which then made it easier for us to extend the IDE, and uh, and so you end up to, to where you are today because we, you know you go into organizations and and um, even, you know most organizations are multilingual. They're not like it's not R or Python; it's R and Python, right? And so a lot of people ask us, "Hey, can you can you could you just give us R Studio for Python users?" And we're like, "Well, we're, we're not positioned to be." the, you know, sort of general purpose IDE. But what I tell people is that we've done enough in this uh, 1.2 release to make it so that if R, if Python is your second language um, and R is your primary language, you don't ha- you may not have to leave the IDE for that. Yeah, it's very, very powerful stuff. And while I'm admittedly not as much of a Python user in my day-to-day work, I'm always keeping a, a bit of a watchful eye on some of the development, especially when you get to the things like deep learning, machine learning, and, and those um, analysis techniques. So it's very nice that when I am able to have a project that takes kind of the, the best of both worlds, I have a place where I can integrate with that seamlessly and bring that from R to Python and back and forth. That's going to be extremely powerful. And I know I have some colleagues at, at the day job that are doing similar things with that. So we're definitely keeping a close eye on that on that side of it. Um, but yeah, speaking of things like the, the RStudio ID and how those integrations are going, um, I've shared this story in maybe previous episodes, but I was one of the very, very early adopters of the IDE. I installed it on my home system, and I was like, "Where has this been all my life of recent hard <laughs> code?" And then when when you all released the uh, open source server version, that I was, as a Linux geek, I was like, "Hey, I can throw this on my Ubuntu server at home and try it out." And then right. sure enough, it worked great. And I thought, "Well, geez, if it works great here, why can't it work at, at the day jobs?" And I got a virtual server. And I was adminning the RStudio server open source version at work for about yep. three or four years. And so we got so many people using it that it was kind of getting over my head a little bit. And luckily, that's when you all had the, the professional the pro product. Of that. Yeah. Yep. So RStudio just, um, you all have a, a very um, comprehensive release version 1.2. And there's a lot of awesome features that I've been reading about and haven't tried all of them yet, such as the remote launcher and the integrations of other languages. But maybe give our listeners a bit of a snapshot of this release and 
also what kind of things that may be in the future for the IDE this year. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a, this has been a massive, uh, massive release for us. Um, so we, I don't, I don't know, it's been over a year worth of work, uh, getting it out, but, uh, but, you know, you sort of touched at one of the largest uh, changes on the commercial side and the pro product side, uh, which is the, the introduction of the launcher. And this is sort of a technology that we, um, we, we introduce. It's going to start out in the IDE, but then ultimately make its way also into Connect and, uh, and Package Manager. But essentially, you know, historically, if you've, if you've used any of our server products, you know that like when you, when a, when you make a connection to that server from a browser, right? Let's say you're, you're looking to connect to RStudio server, right? That R process will start on the same machine that received that request. Right? Correct, yeah. And so when you think about trying to scale, you have to sort of put a load balancer, you know, sticky load balancer, you add extra nodes, and, and that's how you would sort of scale if you wanted to have more and more um, uh, folks sort of using uh, R. And, um, one of the things that we had heard very early on in my conversations, uh, particularly in the pharma uh, industry, was that they're like, listen, we have, you know, we have these grid engines out there and we really want to be able to use these grid engines and, and so on. And uh, we said, hey, we'll, we'll get to it eventually. And, and that eventually is today, right? So basically now we have the technology in place that allows you to configure our Studio Server Pro um, with with different um, uh, backends, and so we'll sh when we start out, you know, you'll you'll start out being able to sort of connect to, to Kubernetes, for example, which is um, which is a, um, a distributed uh, system for uh, for job handling, and so it's a job orchestration layer, and um, we'll add uh, Slurm and maybe LSF and maybe SunGrid engine over time. But uh, the idea is that these are this is built in a pluggable way, so people could sort of write their own plugins if they wanted to. They're their favorite. Uh, orchestration layer and then you know this this new world sort of become you know i tell people now like if you if you fast forward 18 to 24 months or maybe it's two years to three years uh, i imagine most organizations will have like maybe two r studio server pros two r studio connects and two r studio package managers and only and you only have two of each because of uh, high availability but fundamentally you're basically running all of your compute in a more centralized way you're managing your your nodes of, and you're sort of you have these elastic workloads that are sort of coming and going and you know i think that's the future that we're sort of uh, uh, moving towards so that's that's that you know that's the centerpiece if you will of the commercial uh, uh, release of the r studio server pro but but the open source side obviously and it, it sort of inherits everything that comes along with the open source uh, uh, release as well and uh, but and that was a monumental release for us, right? So it, you know whether whether it's the the Python support, the adding sort of support for D three, uh, uh, so SQL support, stand support, um, improvements to uh, uh, so adding like the, the jobs pane stuff. There's a it's a it's a lot of um, there's a lot of features, and so in terms of what's next. We, um, I think it's going to take us a little while to sort of w make sure that we've worked out all the kinks. I mean, yeah, we've had it out for, for some time. And so hopefully, hopefully there aren't too many other issues, but you know, as you know, there are new releases of R that sometimes break things or introduce uh, change, it require changes and whatnot. So Absolutely. I expect us to be patching, uh, you know, sort of having a point release or two along the way, but, um, and then, uh, and then typically we, we frankly don't discuss too much what we're, what we're doing until we're closer to, to making it, you know, available for people to try out. But, uh, sure. the thing that I'm most interested in is, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about us investing in, uh, accessibility. So that's actually one of the things that I've, we've been wanting to do for a long time. We're finally in a place as a company where, where we can afford the, the level of engineering needed to, to make, uh, the IDE more accessible. Uh, um, to uh, to folks with uh, various sort of d disabilities, and so my hope is that um, that will uh, get going on that side. I don't know when that will land, mind you, but but it is something that is, uh, is sort of like a big, um, a big hairy uh, uh, and audacious goal for us is to to make this uh, uh, better for everyone. So. Yeah, that sounds really exciting, and I know that's uh, quite a challenge, technically speaking, and like you said, having the the right uh, engineers in mind to. Um, work on that kind of feature. I know in other languages or other um, products, it's very difficult sometimes for for those with you know, vision issues or things like that to really use your ID, those products effectively. So yep. I really appreciate the, the focus that you all will have on that. Um, I have a bit of a, maybe a, a, a bit of a funny uh, anecdote here to share. Um, speaking about Shiny itself, and of course, our, our studio, you all have the um, Shiny Apps IO service and the Shiny Server Pro and, and our studio Connect to handle Shiny Apps. But 
I've heard from reliable sources that in the very early days of Shiny, that you earned the reputation of being Mr. Shiny. Oh, <laughs> and I, as a as a shiny, you know, a big fan. Of course, I I launched a shiny developer series very recently. I gotta know what's a, what's a backstory about what's the Mr. backstory shiny of Mr. Here? Shiny? Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. the oddest story ever. So basically, what I, so I like I said, I joined the organization in 2013. We we built it. We built out a team to sort of tackle different. Uh, um, you know, we we're working on Shiny Server Pro and our Studio Server Pro. And then one of the ideas that we had is like, you know what? Let's build a online service that really makes it easy for people to deploy those Shiny applications, right? So it's almost think of it like Heroku for Shiny, right? Yes. And um, and at the time, you know, there's one engineer and I, I, I was basically doing uh, support, gathering feedback, et cetera, right? Like I was like <laughs> the other person on the team. And so I, I just got good at being able to answer questions. And, uh, and then one of those days, some gentleman, I don't know, I think he's somewhere in East Asia or something, he sent a note saying, Dear Mr. Shiny, can you answer this question for me, right? And then, <laughs> and and, uh, and so like you know, so immediately like Andy, who, who was uh, the lead on the Shiny apps, I you know, sort of you know puts it out there on on our 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 um, um, our message or email or something like that, and and so people started jokingly calling me Mr. Shiny, and so now on our you know on our Slack channel, if you put you know colon Mr. Shiny, my face pops up. I joke that it's mostly because I'm a bald man, you know, so. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, it never hurts to have a reputation that reflects both uh, appearance and technical ability, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's the that's the inside scoop on that. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, I, I definitely don't deserve it in terms of any work on building Shiny or improving Shiny. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that does, it does remind me a bit. I've heard, um, again, from very reliable sources that you are one of the most talented data scientists within our studio. Oh, that's not true. That's not true. Yeah, that, Hadley, so what? I think it depends on what you, I think I'm one of the, I, I was one, I'm probably one of the people that most tries to leverage our tools to understand uh, our data, right? So if you think about, so I, starting very early on, um, this is this was my first gig as a, as a president of, of a company. And so uh, I think the board was understandably worried about having, you know, just put money in and they're like, all right, well, we need to talk to you every six weeks. And so um, which normally, nor most companies, historically, you meet like once a quarter, right, with your board. But I was meeting with them every six weeks for the first, I don't know, uh, six, well, maybe it was nine months or so of that. Okay. And so JJ is like, you know what, you should really learn our markdown and, um, and um, you know, do it as IO slides. And so I started playing with that. And I really, I really liked it as an idea. Like, I'm like, this is, this is really cool because, you know, remember, I'm a, I'm a software engineer at heart, right? I'm a, mm -hmm. And so this was a chance for me to touch code and say that it is part of my job, right? Um, and so I ended up, you know, you get really attracted to it. So I started building uh, the dashboards that way. And then um, and then when we had Shiny Apps IO coming out, we're like, oh shoot, we need an admin tool. So I looked at the Shiny dashboard and I built a Shiny. So we still use the Shiny dashboard that I created um, to sort of like manage like, oh, somebody's account got locked. Somebody needs to be have extra hours added to them or, you know, um, and that's still the same shiny application that we, uh, that I created like three years ago. So I am willing to dig in and, and play with, um, with R and with our data and, and understand it. And I, and I've, you know, I, I think Hadley has gotten his fair share of particularly the early days of Dplyr. I'm like, well, this doesn't work. This doesn't make sense to me or whatever. Right. So, um, so I'm, I'm still, I think a pretty good, uh, proxy for, like I'm not as smart as our community is, so, you know. So I don't have PhDs and or masters in, in statistics or whatnot, and so I feel like if I can't use it, then then it's not as easy as it should be, right? And so it ends up being, uh, you know, um, Yi Wei calls it the T test, right? Does it pass the, <laughs> does it pass the T test? Uh, so when he builds something, I'm like, oh, okay, I tried it out. I'm like, Yi Wei, this doesn't make sense. He's like, okay, so it doesn't pass the T test. I have to go back and and make a change to the interface and so on and so forth. So, um, so I, I have a, I love, I love the. Um, like the reason I took that course with Coursera in the first place was that I have, uh, I had a very strong belief, and it's only gotten stronger since then. That like, you can't really be a very good leader, certainly in, in engineering and operations, and not know how to slice and dice your data, right? Not know how to, to how to understand it, how to visualize it. Um, and I would now extend it to say, like, you know, you can't be a really good leader of a company if you don't understand. Uh, the, what your data is telling you, right? And so having that discipline and comfort of being able to dig in and ask those questions and see if you can convince yourself of that and uh, having that level of data literacy, I think is 
is really, really important. And, and that's what I'm excited about is like, let's, let's make these tools really easy for people to use. And R is uniquely positioned because of its power in terms of uh, creating DSLs, right? I think you can, you know, the tidyverse, if I had seen the tidyverse first, uh, I think I would have fallen in love faster with R, you know? Yeah, um, well said, so. probably similar for me too, where it was, I, I still needed it, like I mentioned earlier, to complete my dissertation, but the learning curve was immense, especially somebody that comes from a background of a little Perl, a little PHP, a little, a lot of SAS, ironically enough. So that transition was ugly, I'll just say. <laughs> so, so yeah, the Tidyverse is really a nice gateway to, to see the power of the language in a more expressive kind of interface. So yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's some really excellent points. And I just want to mention that, yeah, these tools that are offered to us, and again, getting back to Shiny for a second, I've been able to use that to do similar things to what you're doing in the sense of, you know, every company does have a boatload of data that they can use to, you know, look at metrics or how things are performing, looking at talent, things like that. And just the, the power of Shiny with automated reporting and the inter- integrations you can, you can put in with other languages, that has really helped me, you know, share with leadership where I work of how the power that we can have to interpret this data and get meaningful results to, to our executives. So yeah. And, and, very and honestly, <laughs> yeah, honestly. And the other thing is I don't, I mean, I don't know how much you've done this, but like, I love, like, I love our markdown too. And I think that, you know, I think many people have yet haven't quite internalized all the things that you can do with, uh, with our markdown. But for me, like we've now have, like I get a daily report that's sent to me in email, right? This is through Connect's functionality, but you could obviously build your own using just a cron tab thing that, that runs it. But, yep. uh, but fundamentally, like just being able to get a report every day that gives me a sense of, okay, how are we doing against, you know, how, how much new pipe have we created? What we've closed, what's churned, how are we doing against our target? You know, it's a flex dashboard that gets emailed to me, and now it's sort of get we've we've extended it so that you can get like a, a subject line that gets modified based on what what the data says and when the and the email block. So, I mean, to me, that is really really amazing when you think about the fact that it's all code. I can read it. It's all versioned. Uh, you know, if you've listened to sort of my talk at the at the conference, I I I, we, I, I sort of detail why we love code so much, right? Yes, but, that was but a great love, talk. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. People should definitely check that out. But uh, but I love I love the 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 fact that you can you know you can essentially read this stuff, right, and and get a feel for like okay, this is what this is doing, and if there's a mistake, I can see it, right, or I can write tests against that if I need to. But uh, but getting those kinds of reports on a regular basis is is really fantastic. Um, but yeah, so anyway, it's all good. It's all, it's amazing. I, I think that one of the biggest, uh, issue that we have as a community is that most people don't know what's possible. Right. And that's actually yes. the, the challenge. And, and I don't, you know, we're, we've, we, we've, we've invested quite a bit in sort of building up an education team last year. Um, and, uh, you know, education has always been part of our DNA, if you will, right. Whether it's Hadley or Garrett, uh, in the, in the very early days. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, it is a it is an interesting problem, which is that like most people don't know what's possible. And even if you are in the community, sometimes unless you're on top of like all the releases of what's coming out, uh, you may not see the connections and say, "Oh shoot, I can put this and that together, and now suddenly I don't have to do this other thing altogether." Right. Um, so, so that's yeah. that's the problem that I'm most interested in in solving is is how do we make that more visible to folks right and uh that's part of the reason that we invested in our studio cloud frankly is to uh is to be able to put these primers online be able to make it easy for people to share these kinds of analyses uh put make a make it make a forum for people to 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 be able to say hey you know this is a cool analysis i've just built and as you know you were a contestant on the on the shiny you know for shiny uh contest and uh and one of the things i loved is that you know the education team decided to require a link to the r studio uh, cloud project. So anybody who could take a look at, you know, how, you know, how did you write that code, Eric, right? What, what are the, what, what, and let me try it out and then I can maybe tweak it. I, I want, I want the, I want people to have sort of an easier way to get in and play with it. That's that, that whole feature came about because of a, of a blog post I read on our bloggers, I don't know, three years ago, that was something like, maybe it was two years ago. I can't remember exactly, but somebody had like an analysis showing Steph Curry, the basketball players. Oh uh, yes. I've never seen chart. those. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I saw that. I'm like, Oh, that's awesome. I want to build a shiny application uh, uh, for that so that I can, you know, substitute different players. Right. 
And I started trying to get this up and running on my machine. And here's the GitHub repo link and so on and so forth. But like I had to install all these packages and I I, <laughs> I, I screwed up like one of the packages that had to be installed from, from GitHub and something screwed up on my machine. And I'm like, man, this was, you know, I spent half an hour and then I couldn't get it all up and running. Uh, I eventually got it up and running, but it was just such a pain. Now compare that to a world where I can just get a link, I open it up, I get this Docker container that has all the things in it and I can start playing with it immediately. That's that's exciting to me. And I think my hope is that once we get our studio cloud to be, you know, get it out of alpha into beta, may open it up to even more people in the world, um, that, that that will sort of spur more people to sort of share all these cool ways of, of working with R and what you can what you can accomplish with it. Yeah, it's a testament to sometimes it's not enough just to share code on GitHub per se, but having that environment where I can go to one of those contest submissions. And again, I've, I mentioned it in the Shining Dev series, but those submissions have blown my mind and I have like 10 or 20 ideas that I want to kind of leech off or you know, borrow, be more polite about it, um, right. for my work in the future, but be able to, like you said, tweak it in, in the cloud instance and not have to worry about, uh oh, I forgot the dev tools version or the exactly. development version of exactly. DT or, or one of the other uh, more um, niche packages. So it's been very helpful for learning. And I certainly hope that, yeah, the RStudio Cloud product is, is continuing the momentum for kind of, like you said, that yeah. awareness piece of being able to reproduce these environments. Yeah, no, it's been it's been great. Honestly, you know, universities have sort of been running with it. And, uh, you know, even though in the early conversations, they're like, some of them told us, oh, we would never run an alpha product. But now <laughs> some of them have now run well, two semesters worth on the alpha product. Yeah, you be, be careful what you wish for, as they say, where yeah, you put exactly. out a great product, even at the yeah. early stages. And of course, I was one of those with the early stages of Shiny when it was definitely not much for production use yet just due yep. to the, the way it was working but i was yep. like i gotta try this out because the, the gains far outweigh the cons at that point and now right. of course it's much more right. suitable for production right. um that see yeah this is what i'm fascinated about in terms of what your company is doing with these different products that kind of touch many different aspects of data science and, and infrastructure and reproducibility I, I could use a lot of adjectives here yeah. Maybe um, give our give our audience a bit of a idea. What else is kind of on the roadmap with respect to, like I said, this business and commercial side of our studio? Yeah. Like so how you will be offering these products to customers as we go forward? Yeah. So I mean, we in October of last year we released a product called our Studio Package Manager, and and the idea there was that like we saw some organizations sort of essentially struggling with how do you how do you keep things up to date? How do you manage? Uh, 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 how do you manage dependencies? You know, the IT team typically doesn't really want to know a lot about R. They just, they're like, this is so weird. It's so different than what we're used to. And it's because they're used to, you know, like they have people that use Python. They don't have enough people that use R. And now you're talking about putting R in production. So we so we created that product. Uh, we actually recently also created the, this uh, uh, website called environments.rcudo.com to help people sort of think about, um, you know, packages and package dependencies and repositories and, and different paths of like what are the what are the ways that an organization can um uh can be thinking about um installing you know using rep repositories within within those organizations to, to sort of um, manage reproducibility and so on and so forth but so we created that in october and then we, one of the thoughts that we had is like wouldn't it be nice for people to just be able to get a bundle of all of these uh, uh products together and so you know in in the coming weeks we're going to be announcing uh the our studio team uh, bundling of our products and the idea there is that you can come in and sort of essentially get all of our pro products in a, in a discounted price so hopefully if, as people are sort of more committed to R, they can they can uh, get going with uh, with this full suite um, we also in our conference had announced that we had extended our studio connect to be able to support publishing of uh, Jupyter notebooks and uh, reticulated uh, shiny applications and our markdown docs. And so the idea here is that if, if you have an organization that has uh, a mix of R and Python users, you don't have to decide whether, whether you know, like you don't, you, you, you can have a one publishing platform for both of them. And so that's, uh, so our, our hope is that this will make it easier for people to adopt this on, on, on an organizational level and uh, and get that going. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I think it's going to uh, make a big difference. And obviously the launcher, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be uh, opening up this uh, this whole new vector 
And as part of that change is, frankly, is, is it's going to move us more towards a user-based pricing model, which I think is, is ultimately going to make uh, life easier for everybody because uh, the alignment, like the notion of servers is basically disappearing in this new world order that we're living in with Dockerized containers and elastic computing infrastructure and so on and so forth. So I think that hopefully will tie the value more back to, uh, uh, to the key constituents and, and, and you worry less about uh, uh, servers. So that's uh, those are the big changes that are coming down the pike immediately. I mean, there's a long list of uh, our backlogs are uh, seemingly infinitely long, <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, yeah, the the for the next six months, I think I would I, our focus is going to be much more about like uh, spit and polish, making sure that we sort of. Um, uh, address you know the uh, the rough edges where they are you know get our studio cloud out of alpha and to beta um, you know where we rev our studio package manager and connect pretty much every six to eight weeks and so they're, they're, these are it's a rolling thunder there if you will of, of changes that are coming down the pike but I think the big change for organizations is we're going to make it easier for you to be able to buy uh, the whole stack together yeah this is an interesting um, uh, shift because yeah, as you're obviously well versed in, in the, the trends and the in the technology, especially with with cloud and these elastic type services and, and Docker, you know, Docker being very prominent for containers, that it's not a lot of organizations. Um, you might maybe the bigger ones, maybe even the smaller ones, are taking this hybrid approach where you have a mix of on-premises infrastructure especially for situations where you have to keep data or keep analysis results within a firewall, but then be able to have the flexibility of spinning up instances and in say Amazon AWS or Google to be or whatever the, or Azure or whatever the frameworks are. And it sounds like this new kind of focus on, on this um, way of getting this collection of the enterprise products that you're offering without being tied to a specific server is really meant to adapt to this newer kind of this newer hybrid approach that a lot of exactly. organizations are going That's through. exactly right. And I think okay. what's what, one of the things that's really interesting for me is when I first joined, uh, you know, we'd have conversations with uh, with prospects and customers and they're like, oh, our data will never leave our firewalls, right? And now what they've done is they've sort of redefined the firewall to mean the VPC. Yes, VPC, and so, exactly. And so you can, and so, and so, you know, you want to be able to get the full power of the cloud uh, but you're still probably going to run into VPC. And so what we're trying to do is just make that easier and easier for you. Actually, and over the last year, we've sort of introduced um, our Studio Server Pro into all the major marketplaces online, right? So it's, you know, um, Amazon, uh, Azure, and uh, and Google. And we just recently sort of got uh, Connect up on uh, on two out of the three, and we'll, we'll add the third one shortly. And so over time, our goal is to just make sure that our pro products are available to people where, where they are. And, and obviously, the pro products are meant to make the IT team's life easier. And so hopefully that will uh, drive them to say, you know what? Yeah, I could maybe do this extra work and try and get everything up and running myself and maintain it myself and so on and so forth. But I believe in this company. I believe, you know, I, I want them to be, be investing in the open source uh, uh, packages that we use all day long. And so this is a good way for us to support them and save ourselves a whole bunch of time and effort uh, and have someone to call at the end of the day. And so that's that's, that's the thesis. That's the game that we're playing, and and so far so good. You know, I mean, we're we were uh, up to about 130 people now, which is, which is awesome, and and we're still off of that first round of funding. So, um, so that's been uh, that's been really good. That's that's great. Sounds like yeah, the future is looking very bright, and um, hopefully, um, you know, the organizations that are going to be investing in the in the products you offer will be able to transition to this new approach smoothly, and that. No matter the size of the organization, whether it's a very, very large enterprise or if it's a more nimble startup that's doing a lot of data science, but not a lot of, like you said, IT support or, or engineers that can help with adminning that on the nine to five kind of you know uh, time scale, that the, there's a good balance of how these products offering to minimize the footprint needed for an IT department to put this at scale. But at the same time, for those that do have the resources, can mix and match at will how the best integrate these things together with things like the VPC that's or exactly right. premises. So yeah, hopefully that exactly. balance is striking well, but I guess uh, time will tell. We'll, right? we'll find <laughs> out. We'll find out. That's why they play the games, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But it's a, it's a fascinating area to be involved in. And of course, as a I'm, you know, I'm a classically trained statistician. I've always been, you know, in tune with technology and the open source community. I'm a, a Linux junkie, but seeing how I can build all, tie all this together with R itself, that's again, that's uh, 
it, it makes my job fun. And it, so I like to do this for a hobby too, is to see what awesome things we can create here. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a real pleasure talking with you about all oh, these thank ideas. Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to make sure if you wanted to tell the listeners anything else that they should be aware of or how they might be able to get a hold of you if they have questions. What, what yeah. I mean, uh, I, that's a great, that's a great question. So, um, uh, I, obviously I'd love to f- hear feedback. So if, if you, if anybody has, uh, questions or their concerns or whatnot, we were even talking about potentially having like hosting a once a month thing where people can ask me anything, right. Kind of, kind of thing. And so I think that we might try that out. Uh, the community, uh, dot is a fantastic place for people to sort of ask questions. And, uh, Absolutely. and even, if, even if I don't catch it myself, if, if the question is addressed to me, somebody will point that out to me and I'm, I'm happy to hop on and, uh, and answer and, uh, and engage. But, uh, yeah, generally if, if folks have feedback for us, I mean, at the end of the day, I think everybody, all of us are, are trying to do the same thing. We're trying to have a very strong, vibrant community that, um, uh, where where we can contribute uh, to that growth, and um, and I happen to think that in order to do that well for us, we need to make sure that this is a profitable business that can be around 20, 30 years from now, and not not be beholden to larger uh, organizations, right? And so uh, that's the that's the bet that we're making. That's the play that we're trying to run. And uh, if, if folks have questions, uh, you know, please or, or suggestions, feel free to reach out. Absolutely. Well, again, it's been loads of fun to talk with you. I hope I get to see you again at um, at, at the minimum next year's our studio conference and yeah, absolutely um, other other opportunities too. So, thank you, Tariq, for joining. Thank you today. so much for having me today. It was great. Awesome. All right, All everybody. Right. We'll be back right after this. All right. Well, my thanks again to Tariq for taking time out of his very busy schedule to join me for that special um, interview. And it's one of those things where you you think you know some parts of how things work or some background, but there's always so many other things you learn about the makeup of a company like our studio that's heavily leveraging open source and building a business around it. So really some fascinating tidbits in that in that discussion. So I really hope you enjoy listening to that um as always if you have feedback for the show you can uh, send your feedback through the episodes post on the r podcast website that of course is r-podcast.org i'm also trying to be a little more active on social media so if you want to send your your feedback on twitter feel free to find me with the handle at the rcast and also, um, if you have ideas for future guests that you'd like me to try and bring on the show, or um, if you want to be on the show, um, definitely, like I said, fill out, uh, send me an email at thercast at gmail.com or fill out the contact page at r podcast.org slash contact or reach out on social media. I'm always um, one of the biggest pleasures I have with this podcast is connecting with the community and you know um, sharing ideas and learning from all of you okay with that that's going to wrap up episode 30 so until next time end of line